All right. Uh, it was back in 1984 that the Schiller Institute was formed, and it was done at the time uh, as a result of a great crisis that existed at that time, the threat of potential nuclear war between the Soviet Union and the United States. It was actually originally an idea that was offered to the United States State Department, which they uh, unceremoniously refused, and therefore it was initiated by the, uh, the the person that had come up with the idea in the first place, Helga LaRouche. I say that because the issue was that a great cultural renaissance needed to take place in order that there be any higher form of political discourse on the planet. That advice wasn't really taken. And in fact, in the case of the Soviet Union, it disappeared about uh, five years later. Uh, and thereby hangs a certain tale that we'd like to reference in terms of why we do what we do, including what we're doing here. We are not doing this as an effete, um, sort of artsy uh, reference or reflection upon a, a dead white European poet. Okay? We're not doing that. We're doing that because the work of Friedrich Schiller is at the very heart, the very center the dead center of the brain, if you want to put it that way, of the mind of the American Revolution. Uh, Friedrich Schiller was as much a founder of the United States as Alexander Hamilton. It's not a well-known fact, but it's nonetheless the case. Uh, and uh, what I want to do is just to refer to one of his essays, Theater Considered as a Moral Institution, because I think his, his words in our time and in the precise crisis we find ourselves in tonight, vis-a-vis <clears throat> -vis Russia, the United States, and so on, speaks to this. He says, whoever first observed that religion in the mightiest pillar of, is the mightiest pillar of the state, and that laws themselves lose their power once religion is removed, has perhaps given us without knowing or intending it our best defense of the theater on behalf, on behalf of its noblest side. This inadequacy, the unstable character of political laws, makes religion indispensable to the state and also conditions the moral influence exerted by the stage. Laws revolve around duties of denial. Religion extends its demands to true action. Laws restrict only those activities which tend to weaken society's cohesion while religion ordains those which deepen it. Laws, rules, laws rule only over the outward expressions of the will. Religion extends its jurisdiction into the heart's most hidden recesses and pursues thoughts to their most inward source. Laws are slippery, immalleable, as changeable as mood and passion. Religion forms strong and eternal bonds. Now, if we were to assume something which is not the case, if we conceded that religion possessed this tremendous power over every human heart, then will it or can it completely develop our character? Religion, and here I am dealing solely with its divine and not its political aspects, generally acts more upon the sensuous side of the population. Indeed, it is probably because of this effect on the sensuous that its influence is so pure. Deprived of this sensual effect, religion's power vanishes and whence the influence of the stage. Religion ceases to exist for the greater part of mankind the moment we destroy its symbols and, my and mysteries, the moment we efface its renderings of heaven and hell. And yet these are merely fantastic portraits riddles without solution, terror figures, and distant enticements. Consider now how religion and law are strengthened as they enter into alliance with the theater, where virtue and vice, happiness and misery, wisdom and folly are accurately and palpably led out before man in a thousand images, where providence solves its riddles, un untangles its knots before his eyes where the human heart confesses its subtlest stirrings while tortured on the rack of passion, where all masks fall away, the makeup is removed, and truth sits in judgment incorruptible. 
someday when morality is no longer taught, when religion is no longer met with mere faith, faith, when laws become superfluous, we shall still tremble as Medea totters down the palace steps, fresh from the murder of her child. Mankind shall still be seized with healthy terror, and all will silently rejoice over their own clear conscience as Lady Macbeth, the dreadful sleepwalker, washes her hands and summons all the perfumes of Arabia to extinguish the hateful odor of murder. As surely as visual representation is more compelling than the mute word or cold exposition, it is equally certain that the theater wields a more profound, more lasting influence than either morality or laws. Now that is what the subject of tonight is. And that is the subject of tonight, not merely in terms of this event, that is the subject of tonight all over the world. Because unless we can successfully, I believe, uh, reincorporate the principle of the chorus, as Schiller discusses in another essay, the role of the chorus in tragedy, unless we can incorporate that, reincorporate that into American daily life, you probably cannot save the United States. You can no longer appeal to the realm of politics alone to do that. It's impossible because now people have uh, begun to question or have forgotten what it means to be human. That doesn't mean that they're not human. It just means that they are forgetting what it means to be human. And so you have to bring the, the principle of the chorus back into play, as it was done in Greece. And in this city, what we intend to do is have a chorus of some 1,500 or thereabout citizens, not meaning 1,500 people all singing at once, but having 1,500 people involved with us, with a clarity of mission that there's something necessary and required and accessible that we can provide as citizens as a way of reconvicting our nation to its true mission uh, on behalf of freedom, real freedom, not democratic overthrows of governments, not so-called democratic overthrows of governments, but, but a real change in the human heart which causes people to on their own voluntarily act for the greater good. So that's what we want to do, and I'd like to go now to Helga's uh, Uh, there's approximately, I think, a 19 section, second section that's out of the tape. You may notice it. There's a glitch. And I think at that point there are some statistics being read, which I can refer to if anybody is uh, unclear about what she's referring to at that moment. So that may be noticeable in the uh, tape that, as you see it. Hello. Let me send greetings to your conference at the very beautiful occasion of Schiller's birthday. Uh, a birthday which we celebrate since the foundation of the Schiller Institute every year in many countries around the globe. Now, I want to speak to you about some of his works which many of you probably know, but which I think is of really the highest actuality right now, namely about what Schiller develops in the aesthetical letters. As you know, he wrote these, uh, these letters dealing with the ed aesthetical education of men in the context of the failed French Revolution, because he was asking how comes that a great moment found such a little people? And he came to the conclusion the objective possibility for change was there, but the subjective, the moral condition was lacking. Now, if that was true for Schiller's time, I think it is all the more true for our time, and not only for Europe, but also for the United States. A couple of days ago, the New York Times had this unbelievable article, which reported about a study according to which the death rate of middle-aged Americans, white Americans, between the age of 40 and 50 years old, is increasing 10% for the average and 22% for the poor. Now, 40 to 50 years is not an age you should die. <laughs> These are the best years. So what has happened? Well, the reason uh, of 
this death cause is drug addiction, drug abuse, alcohol, and suicide. Now, if you look at the circumstances otherwise in the United States, uh, you have a rapidly sinking living standard for a large part of the population. People have to work longer hours. They have almost no leisure time. The permanent wars, which the United States has been involved in since the Bush senior administration and then the two Bush junior administration and now Obama, has meant that many families are torn apart. The fathers are going on several tours to Iraq, Afghanistan, and so forth, coming back with post-traumatic stress disorder. Many times the families don't survive that. Uh, <clears throat> the 60% of the people in New York alone are either on the poverty line or below, 60%. The uh, CDS, the Center for Disease Control, reported uh, that there is a drug epidemic in the United States where, for example, one in 10 people in Baltimore are heroin users. Then low interest rate, zero interest rate is eating away the savings of many people who are saving for their pension. You have the police violence due to the fact that the police has been militarized. You have the black-on-black -black violence, school shootings, the homicide rate is going up continuously. And then you have the barbaric drone killing uh, conducted by the United States uh, abroad. So just to highlight a couple of these things, <clears throat> it means that the United States is really in a dark age and nobody can deny that. So how do we change this? How can we change this nightmare? And I think that what Schiller has developed in the aesthetical letters is today as much the method how to get people out of it as it was to his time. He said, how do you, where do you find the venue? Where should the change come from? It cannot come from the state because it is the state itself which is the cause of evil in its present form. And the state would have to be re-established first on more noble principles if the state was supposed to change this. Reason <clears throat> itself, he says, will select the most noble fighter and supply him or her with divine weapons. And then he says, how comes that in modern times, with all the knowledge and all the technology, is it that we are still barbarians? To, there must be something in the mind of people, in the character of human beings, which prevents the direct reception of truth. And therefore he says, sapere aude, be courageous to be wise. And he mentions the myth, the ancient myth, that the goddess of witness, wisdom came to earth already in full armament. And her first action was a warrior-like uh, uh, deed. Now, most people are too much under the burden to take care of their livelihood that they don't want and cannot take the additional burden to think. And therefore, they have an inclination to take the opinion from some group to which they belong, be it the church, the priest, the club, the peers, the media, and any other group. To have wisdom and to love wisdom one already has to be wise to appreciate it. So therefore, the question is, how does one find a way to the mind? And Schiller says, you have to find it through the heart. And therefore, he came to the conclusion that the development of what in German is called Empfindungsvermögen, sensuous comprehension of the world, the ability of the totality of emotions and intellect to absorb the world and improve it, that that development is the most important task of our time. He says, all improvement in the political realm, therefore, can only come through the ennoblement of the character of the individual. But how can this occur when the state is in such a barbaric condition? And Schiller gives the, for some surprising answer, it can only happen through beautiful art, because 
classical art and science are the only two areas which have an immunity against the arbitrariness of the despot. The despot, the tyrant, can outlaw law, law, uh, art, but he can't rule in it. <clears throat> the artist uh, can be the son of his time, but he should not be its product. The artist must take the ideals from a better, more noble period. But how does the artist protect himself from the influences of his time? By despising its judgment. He has to take the highest ideals, not, uh, but not the basic imperatives, and not present them as basic imperatives, but to present them in a playful way. He says, the only way how you can eliminate rawness in the behavior is you have to take it out of leisure time and out of the entertainment. And slowly, then the rawness will also be bent from the convictions. Rawness will be overcome through beauty in art. But it has to be a notion of beauty which is not derived from experience. But beauty must be defined as a notion uh, by reason, through the abstraction of reason. You have to come to the conclusion that if man is supposed to be worthy of man, of the dignity of mankind, beauty must be seen as an absolute necessary condition of humanity. Beauty in art belongs both to the realm of reason, if it's defined in this way, and to the world of the senses, because it reconciles both. It ennobles our senses and develops them up to the level of reason so that there is no contradiction anymore. In the introduction of The Bride of Messina, which is a play by Schiller, he says that the experience of great art invokes in the mind of the audience a power a power which sets him really free and not just for the moment. It sets him internally free, a power that does not go away after the performance is over. Because it sets free the divine characteristics in the human being, the inner directedness, the self-guiding, that ability to think and be creative for yourself without groupthink. If the United States is to be saved, for its, from its present condition of barbarism, then only through a Renaissance movement inspiring the population through the beauty of great art, only that can accomplish that. And as Schiller says, truth and beauty will be received by the more noble souls in society and then from there spread in milder rays throughout the whole population. So therefore, dare to be wise and join us. So Chris, Chris Sayer, Scott Mooney, and Bill Roberts. Go ahead. Oops. side of Detroit. Um, and this was typically where men would gather, working men would gather after work and sing men's choruses, um, men are core, as they're called. So we're going to, uh, this is a piece uh, set by Franz Schubert, uh, 
uh, set from a, a poem by Friedrich Schiller entitled Die Zwei Tugendwege. And I'm going to read the, uh, the English translation to this. <clears throat> the two paths to virtue. Two are the ways by which man strives upward to virtue. If one is closed to him, the other will open up. It is by acting that the fortunate achieves it. By toleration, the sufferers achieve it. Blessed is he whose fate lovingly leads to both. Can you join us? Schubert's mentor core, um, and I am not a man. <laughs> I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be filling the void for the bass section. <laughs> just this is just one of the other. It's another Schubert mentor core called Unendliche Freude, Unending Joy. It's actually from um, Schiller's poem on Elysium, which is. As far as I understand, it's like a, a heaven for the gods. And um, just the quick translation is obviously right here in front of you. Unendliche Freude, unending joy, durchwalet das Herz, fills the heart. Here, man gelt der Name dem trauenden Leide. Here, the name of mournful sorrow is missing. Sanftes Entzücken nor heißet man Schmerz. Pain is called mere gentle delight. So it's such uh, kind of a, well, anyway, it's, it's, it's such a delightful place that even pain is delightful. You know. So again, it's another mentor core and Unfortunately, I'm not a man, but will be, uh, not unfortunately. <laughs> I'm filling.
filling the void for the bass section. Do you need notes? I need notes, yeah. You're doing the high beat. Say, unfortunately, there aren't your hands. Yeah, there you go. Is that right? Love, Fosh, Mark, Ruby. So, Tony, if you would come up. While Tony is coming up, I'd just like to say that uh, 25 years ago at the former Alice Tully Hall, uh, Tony Morris conducted a concert opera version of Beethoven's Fidelio at the tuning of C-256. Um, Tony had met us a few years earlier, but he's been associated with the Schiller Institute for over a quarter century. It's always my pleasure and honor to have him come up and give us a few words. And he just retired as a conductor. He's been conducting for 55 years. So. Thank you, Dennis. It's been a pleasure to have been associated with you so, for so many years. Um, as many of you know, my last opera was Lucia. Uh, some of you were kind enough to come to the performance. And since this is Schiller's birthday, I'd like to connect my own experience uh, with conducting with the ideals of Schiller, who's come to be, to me, a very great personal hero. I want to read you just a little bit from an encyclopedia I used to own when people owned encyclopedias <laughs> about some of his accomplishments. What they say, this is Johann Christoph Friedrich von Schiller, German poet, dramatist, philosopher, and historian, who was regarded as the greatest dramatist in the history of the German theater and one of the greatest in European literature. I myself would place him ahead of every other European dramatist except William Shakespeare. An extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary man, but what this encyclopedia doesn't tell us is that he was educated very thoroughly as a lawyer and as a doctor. At age 21, he was the chief uh, surgeon of a regiment of soldiers belonging to the Duke of Württemberg. At 22, he wrote his first hit play and was famous all over Germany, and actually imprisoned by the Duke for taking French leave, leave to go and hear the play. He was not permitted to do that. And the Duke lectured him severely when he returned about never writing another word of literature. This to one of the twin towers of German literary achievement in history. So he made a dashing escape from the prison and lived for the next 10 years in various cities of Germany under sometimes an assumed name, 
to avoid extradition to Württemberg. What this doesn't also mention is that he was a major editor of literary journal encouraging the, tal the talents of many other uh, writers besides himself. And he was the most successful theorist of education in the history of Europe. Germany's school system was in terrible shape uh, during Schiller's life. And he drew up plans for the reform of a, of a proper classical education. And after his death in 1805, these suggestions were put into operation by two of his closest friends and disciples, the von Humboldt brothers, one a famous scientist, the other the Minister of Education for the Prussian state in a position to, uh, to uh, implement these reforms. And what was the difference between this and the first class education you could obtain at the Sorbonne or Oxford or Cambridge? Well, very simply that in those institutions, education was reserved for the elites. In Schiller's plan, everybody in society got the same education. What was the result? He produced the most educated nation in Europe, just the way the world has been discovering in our lifetimes that if you don't educate the women in your population, you're missing half of the talent, the human talent that's available. And Schiller's educational reforms took into account the fact that if you want to uh, increase your brain uh, uh, capacity and your uh, population of brilliant people, everybody in society has to be um, has to be educated. It was an amazing discovery, absolutely astonishing. He was a person who from his portraits alone tells you he's a great man, and I have several of them. And what's amazing is that while he is either uh, meditating inwardly, in which case in the portraits you can see the tremendous goodwill the tremendous fineness of spirit and soul that he had, or he's letting his eyes sweep, sweep out in, uh, ahead of him. In that case, you see genius. He looked like a genius, amazingly enough. Absolutely looked like a genius. And in back of those extraordinary eyes, you see a calm, balanced, uh, absolutely rational and developed human being. Um, the encyclopedia goes on to say, that as a whole, Schiller's plays are characterized by moral idealism, strong optimism, eloquent poetic diction, and a classic sense of form. Absolutely ideal combination, obviously. Well, how does this fit in with us? Schiller had the idea, which I personally have experienced in my own life of conducting, that the greatest works of art generate a kind of thrill and a kind of excitement which bring to life areas in yourself that you didn't know you had. You didn't know you owned those areas. And they're the most wonderful parts of you. And I decided early on, uh, following the example of the generation of greatest conductors the world has ever seen, which I came in at the very, big, at the very end of as a very young man. But I'm speaking of people like Arturo Toscanini, Wilhelm Furtwängler, um, Otto Klemperer, um, Erich Kleiber, Bruno Walter, Serge Kusiewicki, Sir Thomas Beecham, Leopold Stokowski. These were amazing personalities, each quite different from one another. And when any one of them appeared on stage, it was like the appearance of an Old Testament prophet. And very often one would go out of such concerts with one's feet not touching the ground. They were so wonderful. The outside, the surroundings look different because you weren't the same person that you were when you came into that hall. That was the effect of the performances. So I decided that if great music could awaken within me centers that were mysterious to myself, that obviously I wanted to spend my time becoming more awake to this particular kind of emotion. And Schiller had the idea that to improve society, you worked with the attractions of the fine arts to put yourself in a position where you, you could appreciate spiritual fineness as well. You used the attraction, the outward beauty of the art to build to a finer character. Now, the interesting part about this is that, although it appears that if you simply concentrate on the beautiful things of life, that you can't go wrong. Not so. 
you have to be in a position where you can make the choice of a, of a higher kind of spiritual life on the basis of what you have felt from the arts, but it has to be a conscious choice. And the proof of this is that two dreadful, murderous regimes of the 20th century, the communist regime and the Nazi regime, were dedicated to high art music. And Hitler and Stalin were both immensely knowledgeable music lovers. And Stalin, when he was dying, wanted to have put on the record player the slow movement of the late Mozart A major piano concerto, which is one of the deepest and most spiritual pieces Mozart ever wrote. And yet Stalin was extremely open to this. That was what was going to console him. And Hitler, on his birthday, required the Beethoven Ninth Symphony to be performed every year. You wonder, how could he listen to that text that says, over the canopy of the stars must a loving father dwell? Or this kiss to the whole world, all men will become brothers? How could he hear those things? But the answer is, of course, that he wasn't listening to the implications, the spiritual implications of those words. He was enjoying the surface beauty and power of the music. Uh, and also, there's another explanation. Both Germans and Russians are tremendously musical people. Uh, in fact, in Germany, you're supposed to love philosophy and music, and if you don't, you fake it. <laughs> and the Russians, the, the, in both cases, to substitute for the absence of religion, both regimes deliberately chose mostly high art music as their substitute for religion because it was so attractive. Misses the point, doesn't it? That's part of a different kind of fineness, which you have to choose. You're not made better simply by listening to good music. Be nice if that were true. You think of the Clockwork Orange, where our her hero was subjected to Beethoven's Ninth at ear-splitting levels for hours at a time, uh, a pr production of absolute disaster. So uh, the attractions of uh, the outward beauties of the fine arts may lure you in, and you hope to make that connection with the higher spiritual level altogether. But I discovered that as I age as a conductor, I'm more and more interested in works that have the qualities of love, compassion, beauty, strength, reverence. A good, healthy, athletic romp, this display of force, this great humor is always welcome. And if the works of art have these qualities, and if the music that I conduct has these qualities, I want to conduct it again and again. If it doesn't have any of these qualities, it may be worthy in other ways, but I'm too old for them. <laughs> so I would say that Schiller uh, is even visibly an example of one of the greatest minds that Europe has ever seen. He conquered substantially every major intellectual endeavor that was put before him in the course of his life, whether it was medicine or law, poetics. He was a major historian, by the way. His uh, history of the Thirty Years' War remains the great classic. And on that basis, he was appointed professor of history. Uh, and to tie in with the theory motive, when he gave his first lecture, he was so famous that there were people hanging out the doors and windows. The, the, stu the students couldn't all fit in the hall. And the question that he posed in that lecture was, what is universal history and to what end do we study it? And his answer was what you might expect from the poet of freedom. His answer was, we study history in order to uh, trace the development of the progress of freedom. That was what history was all about, of the multiplicity, the endless multiplicity of facts. What really mattered was the development of the idea of freedom. And you see, this extraordinary man, who, as I say, has become quite a hero to me. And I say, happy birthday, Scheller. Margaret and Jessica. Jessica, I see. Where's Margaret? Ah, here she is.
Um, bring it down slightly. I did want to um, just introduce a little bit what I'm doing. I'll, I'll be presenting for Leader. Um, two of the poems, the last two poems, are by Schiller. Um, Helga brought up this idea that to reach the mind, you go through the heart. And I wanted to try to add something to what you said, um, though it's quite a challenge, uh, what, what you brought up. Um, for me, what's very important about the question of leader is that this was popular culture at the time, that the poetry um, in the 18th century was the popular culture. These were poems that were known, that were recited. This is, these were ideas that were shared in families with friends, etc. And the great genius, I find, is that you had a musical culture which made this even more beautiful. So you express these incredible ideas of, um, uh, of love, of, um, of what is human love, um, these great ideas of immortality. Um, and you express it in a form which becomes part of the culture. So the culture is discussing these ideas. You're actually at a level where the, these are the, the, great, the great ideas as uh, these questions of freedoms are, are what, you're, uh, are what the, the culture is, is discussing. And then you also had composers who took these, um, these poems that were known and, and added music to them and brought them to a whole new realm. And what, what is fascinating also is that um, composers took the same poems and, and worked with these ideas. And, and there was all kinds of, uh, in that sense, a dialogue um, between these composers and, and the population. One um, word I would like to explain in the German is Gedicht which means, which is the word for poetry in Germany. Um, and uh, it means to condense. It means a condensed form of thought. So um, I, I, I find that extremely important um, to work through an idea in a condensed form of thought. That, that's what poetry is. I had the great um, luck. I was uh, born here in the US. And my parents were members of the LaRouche organization. And at the age of 12, um, we left the great Manhattan and I moved to Germany. So I um, was able to learn German firsthand in that sense. And I was extremely, you brought up this question of Russia and, and Germany. What really struck me is that in German culture, these questions of poems are very alive still. And it's, it's part of the, the interaction of poetry. And I truly wish for America that we would revive it. Um, what, one thought that did come to mind is if you take a poet, Robert Frost, take his very well-known poem, um, and the, it's slipping my mind, the, 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 road the, the Road Not Taken. So whether you love the poem, not, whatever, it's, it's a very interesting idea. But imagine if there were a bunch of classical composers who were composing this poem, and this was the culture that was being shared. So you had a discussion, a dialogue. Um, in the culture about, about poems like this. So um, just very shortly, the, the first poem, the, the Nightingale, I just find it so sweet. Uh, it is, the, it's, a, it's a, a Greek, it's a story from Greek mythology. Um, the beautiful Psyche um, has Cupid on her, on her heart and he has fallen asleep. And um, when he awakes, he has to leave again. Um, so she is saying to um, the beautiful Cupid um, and to God, don't awaken him so he will not leave. Um, and we'll just start with that. Yeah. I'm sorry, I forgot. <laughs> My accompanist is Margaret Sheldon for this piece and um, for the last piece also by Schiller. Margaret Greenspan will accompany me also and then, Sh I'm sorry, I don't know your last name. Cheryl Berard will also accompany me on one of the pieces. <laughs>
ich kann fröhlich sein und scherzen, kann jeder Blut und jedes Blatt mich freuen. Ach, die Galach, ach, die Galach, sing mir den Armur nicht To the next poem, uh, to the next po po uh, poem, Auf dem Wasser zu singen. So it's it's not the one that's listed. It's the, on the back page, Auf dem Wasser zu singen. Um, I, I, just to give an idea of how beautiful this, this poetry was, the opening part paints this beautiful scene, very, very beautiful scene of a, um, a shimmering boat and waves, etc. But then the last stanza um, really transforms into a whole new idea. And I'll just read the English. Alas, away on dewy wings from me on the rocking waves flees time. Tomorrow, away on shimmering wings as yesterday as today, again will flee time until I, upon loftier, Radiant wings, myself shall flee the changing time.
last two um, are poems by Schiller. Um, first, the first one is um, Mädchen's Klage, is, is Tekla speaking, who is a character in Schiller's Wallenstein play, and who you may or may not know was Schiller's favorite character. She was a, a real person, um, but Schiller used poetic freedom to create the daughter of Wallenstein, Tekla, and her beloved, Max, um, to be truly great figures. And um, it is definitely worth reading through the poem, uh, through the play. This poem comes at the very end, uh, when it is clear that her earthly love to Max will not be fulfilled, um, but that she actually, she is above it, which is quite spectacular. The second poem um, I find very interesting from a, a different standpoint, from the standpoint of the challenge to a composer to take such profound thoughts and put them to music. Sehnsucht, or Longing by Schiller, is um, a poem about seeing, be, being here in, in Talisgründen, in your, the, the valley's depth, but seeing and knowing beauty out there. And um, in the last two stanzas, you, you see, he, well, at the beginning he describes what it would be like in, in heaven or in these heavenly areas. And then you see in the last two stanzas, he does, Schiller brings up the, he, you, all of a sudden, the, the person who is telling this story sees a boat and sees it tossing, but, and sees that it's, you know, this boat could fall over it or, or could be uh, schwanken. It, it is tossing about it. It could uh, turn over at any point. And the, the person telling the poem says, and there's nobody who's in that boat who will carry me across this choppy river, this choppy river from the valley of depths to, to out there. And he has this very, very famous and beautiful little stanza. Du musst glauben, du musst wagen, denn die Götter leihen kein Pfand. You must believe, you must dare, for the gods give no guarantee. Only a wonder can bear you into that fair wonderland. So we'll just do those two. Thank you. 
I see Mr. Wilson has already approached. Alessio, you're going first? Yes. All right. This is Alessio Magnaguano. I got it. Okay. And uh, I'm pleased to be here. I'm pleased and honored to be here with you. I apologize first for my, for my English. I am Italian, so I try to speak as better I, I can. Uh, we, me and my wife, after, uh, we go to see, I go, are going to sing two arias from uh, by Verdi. The first aria is uh, from Don Carlo, that was uh, a Schiller uh, drama that Verdi, uh, um, um, that Verdi brought the music for this uh, drama. And uh, I'm going to sing the, the big aria of the fourth act when the, the King Philip is alone in, a, in his uh, study, in his uh, study room, but he's uh, like a jail because uh, as maybe more of, the, of you know, his, uh, his study is in, uh, on the top of the, of the church, of this cathedral. It was a, a little room in which he, he retired to, to think to, and to decide the most important things for his right, for his kingdom. And uh, what is extraordinary, extraordinary of, of this area is that uh, Schiller before and Verdi after uh, find the humanity of this man, this very uh, Great man, because he's the king of a, a, a kingdom very huge, very very large, and uh, he can decide of the death of the life of every person in his uh, kingdom, but uh, he can force his wife to love him, and it is because uh, his wife was uh, permitted to his son, and she is very young, and uh, also if he's not very very old, because he's uh, uh, more or less fourteen. So for today is a is a guy is a is a is a, he's, he's beginning to think what he have to do in the life. Uh, at that time, 40, 40 years was very very old, and maybe Elisabetta was uh, 16, 18. So it's very strange. He has the, 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 the same age of his of his son, and so he, he is very sad because uh, he say she never loved me when she saw my my hair. My white, uh, my white hair, he has the hair, I don't have the hair, but he has the <laughs> hair. Uh, and uh, she, 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 she's very sad. And so he's, he's desperate for this reason. Uh, and uh, uh, um, the very beauty of this uh, act, all the art, is the, the evolution. Because, because after this area, entry, the, the great inquisitor, and there is a duet very famous between these two powers, the power of the king and the power of the church. And uh, I hope to sing one of these days for you with another, another bass, this, uh, this duet, because it's uh, very powerful. Now I don't want to, to, uh, to, um, to rob all your time, and I'm going to sing. I am very honored to be accompanied by Maestro Wilson. And, uh, I'll do my best. Oh, 
resta a finir. L'aurora in bianca il mio però.
wife. And I speak for her because if my English is, uh, she is growing now, she's speaking now because uh, she studied. Well. Excuse me. <laughs> it's good, yes, yes. Uh, she is going to sing an aria, a very beautiful aria from the Balin Maschera. The Balin Maschera, always by Verdi, is not a, a, um, a, an opera on Schiller, but, uh, uh, but on a scribe, and uh, is a, um, a very wonderful opera. The scene we are going to see, to listen, is when, uh, um, uh, excuse me, the, I'm, uh, Amelia. Amelia, I'm not sure, excuse me. I'm so, emo so emotional for before, so. <laughs> Amelia uh, was surprised from, from, uh, by the, her husband, uh, in love with the, with the king of Svezia, really with the governor of Boston, and uh, the, the, the husband wants to keep her. She, is, uh, she says, yes, you're, you're right, but before you kill me, please uh, pray. Let uh, me embrace my, my son. He, he will uh, close my eyes after I die. I will die. And uh, so it's uh, like a pray, a pray to his husband. So a uh, applause for my wife, Fausta Ciceroni. Morro, ma prima in grazia, from the uh, musket ball, pool, uh, from the musket ball. And Atipiano, the wonderful uh, maestro, Robert Wilson.
Uh, before I introduce our last, our next singer, and this is the final singer, let me just say, let's all have a round of applause for Mr. Wilson. If you, if you were listening to the two arias, you know why I asked for that. Uh, so, um, sorry. <laughs> so I want to introduce our final singer for the evening, Miss Dong Ling Zhao. Gao. Okay, and you'll introduce your piece. My name is Dong Ling Zhao, and I'm very honored to be here for the first time. Um, so here tonight, I've brought you a folk song from China. And before that, I would like to tell you a little bit uh, background is uh, in China, we, we have like about 56 minority groups. So, of course, there's a Han major, major um, ethnic group, but they're also, you know, in the mountains or on the, like, in the, like those uh, remote corners, they're always different people, like the tribes, Native American tribes here, it's the same kind of, uh, situation and uh, they all have their language, their music. So today I have brought you is from uh, Xinjiang province. So uh, about Xinjiang and uh, I would like to mention the Silk Road. So it's basically the second city, um, uh, second major city uh, from uh, Xi'an where the Asian emperor is. I'm, I'm sure everyone probably has been is it there? So, anyway, yeah, uh, it's the warrior. It's famous for the warrior. Um, yeah. So this, the name of the song is called "A Glass of Wine." So basically, it's just cheers for love and cheers for life. I hope you like it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. I know we. This is just brand new music it just brought to me. <laughs> Okay, so now we're at our conclusion, and as I understand, I think you've got this on your schedule there, the Gedankens in Frei, this being the anthem of the German resistance, also during the Second World War, 
and uh, I think it's pretty straightforward, and given the theme of the night, it's appropriate. So, is anyone leading us? Are you doing that? Yeah, Michelle? I think we should look through, look through the poetry. Why don't you say what you got to say? Um, there's four verses. The first one is set, and the others are below. Uh, it's, here's a rough translation. First, I want everyone to say, Die Gedanken sind frei. Okay, close enough. <laughs> Thoughts are free. Who can guess them? They fly by like, like nocturnal shadows. No man can know them. No hunter can shoot them with powder and lead. Thoughts are free. I think what I want and what makes me happy, uh, it, they can be thought quietly as is suitable. My wish and my desire, no one can deny me. And so it will always be, thoughts are free. And if I am thrown into the darkest dungeon and all these are futile works, um, in any case, my thoughts tear all gates and walls apart. Thoughts are free. So I will forever renounce all of my sorrows and never again torture myself with pains. Man can in, their, in his heart always laugh and joke and think at the same time, thoughts are free. So um, I would ask, you see there's three lines, the treble, the top line. Um, anyone is welcome to sing it. It's, it's somewhat the melody. It would tend to be sopranos and maybe tenors. Uh, on the bottom line, uh, you can see we repeat the first line, right, twice. Um, the bottom line, the lowest voices should sing the bottom and the middle voices should sing the, the higher one of the bottom. So we can just get our starting note. Everyone may rise. Mm -hmm. 